I'll start by saying the pandemic has caused, as we all know, all sorts of economic fallout around the world. The way macroeconomists usually capture the loss associated with the recession is that they look at economic activity that was expected to occur, but didn't occur. So um, if you do that, for example, for the United States, you'll see that GDP in 2020 was about a trillion and a half lower um, or six and a half percent lower than where our congressional budget office thought it was going to be prior to the pandemic. Um, and I choose the United States not only because I had the data handy, but I also think it puts a somewhat of a lower bound on this across nearly all countries. Um, our experience has been um, milder than in uh, many other countries for reasons I'll come to in a second. Um, but in particular, lower income countries saw more losses in 2020 and are expected to continue to see a gap between their actual activity and kind of what was expected for years to come. So that's costly for them. It's also increasing income inequality across countries. Um, all that said, I think the most significant macroeconomic losses are not just about what happened in 2020. And they're very much related to the much more tragic human toll of the crisis in that we've just lost so many people who could be productively engaged in the economy. And it's not just the devastating numbers of death, we don't know how large the COVID disabled population is going to be. What I can say is if you look at US survey data on how many people say they aren't working because they're sick from the virus or because they're caring for someone who is sick, it's in the millions, which is a substantial fraction of the decline in labor force participation we've seen in the United States since pre-pandemic days. Um, so that's kind of like the all the things that I that keep me up at night that I worry about. I would say that the good news is that the macroeconomic losses in rich countries have been much more limited than anyone thought they would be in April 2020. This brings me to my last point, which is just about lessons. I think there are just two lessons basically, and I think first of all, fight recessions with um, aggressive countercyclical fiscal policy if you as a country have the space to do it. It's not a magic bullet in the sense that some countries don't have that ability to borrow to fund this kind of spending. Um, all countries are gonna have to deal with more debt. Um, and we have more to learn about targeting these fiscal measures and the role, for example, the fiscal response has had in playing in uh, the recent surge in inflation. The second, my second and last lesson is um, we need to build off these pandemic technologies. So remote work can make people in society better off in various ways. It can increase the match between workers and firms, which is good for wages and good for productivity. It offers avenues for firms to be more family friendly. It can potentially address shortages of affordable housing. It hopefully will reduce traffic congestion and pollution. Um, so that's all great. Um, I do worry about the inequities. We know that remote work opportunities are greater for higher earners, and, they, uh, and we also know that they're greater for richer countries than poor countries. So um, I think the fear is that this might be another manifestation of technologies that benefit some people in some countries, um, particularly those in the knowledge economy and not others. Um, but I will leave you not with that unhappy point. I will just say the hopeful point, and this is something we were talking about before the session started, is that these technologies will allow for um, an increase in access to and a reduction in the cost of higher, uh, you know, post-secondary education, higher education, that will offer more opportunities for people to gain skills that will allow them to participate in the knowledge economy.